idea of adapted radiation, uh, where lineages diverge uh, ecologically to exploit uh, ecological opportunities. Uh, so the key to sort of the basic concept of adaptive radiation and all theoretical treatments uh, of adaptive radiation is the presence of uh, divergence or disruptive selection on ecologically relevant morphology uh, in early stages of uh, ecological speciation and diversification. Uh, and so, of course, there's a lot of ways to get uh, divergent natural selection, uh, but one of the sort of appealing ways uh, that we might imagine might be uh, pervasive uh, is via uh, frequency dependent resource competition. Uh, and so, uh, frequency dependent resource competition can create uh, fitness troughs or stable fitness minima uh, that leads to uh, consistent uh, and stable disruptive selection uh, that can lead uh, eventually to ecological speciation. And so, one sort of interesting per couple though is that uh, this disruptive selection that arises from frequency dependent resource competition uh, can lead to other things besides ecological speciation. Uh, and so one of the sort of most uh, commonly thought of uh, is uh, within species polymorphism uh, and primarily uh, ecological sexual dynamics. And so the idea here uh, is that uh, resource competition can uh, lead to sexually antagonistic natural selection uh, to drive ecological character inflation between the sexes. Uh, so just as uh, competition can drive character inflation between lineages, uh, the same competition could drive character inflation between the sections of one species. And so uh, this has led to some sort of interesting uh, theory because the same uh, process of resource competition could lead to uh, potentially alternative outcomes. Uh, and so there's sort of two general predictions we can make from this theory for competition role uh, in adaptive radiation. Uh, and so there's a classic idea uh, that was formalized uh, a little over 10 years ago, uh, is that uh, ecological character displacement between the sexes might stall the progress of adaptive radiation. Uh, the idea here is that uh, basically, when we get ecological divergence between the sexes, that relaxes the strength of disruptive selection uh, that would otherwise potentially lead to ecological speciation. Uh, so we get one or the other. Alternatively, some more recent theory, uh, if we, uh, so this is sort of a univariate model, so if we imagine that uh, selection is multivariate, so there's more than one uh, dimension of resource competition and disruptive selection, uh, we can actually get both speciation and ecological sexual benefits when evolving at the same time. Uh, but under the uh, explicit prediction that we expect them to occur um, in different directions, uh, as shown up here. So uh, uh, phenotypic divergence between species uh, would be predicted to happen uh, independently of phenotypic divergence between the sexes or in different combinations. And so uh, these uh, sort of two predictions, so the, the two predictions basically are that we might rarely expect character displacement between the sexes and ecological speciation to occur together, but when they do, we should occur in independent directions in phenotypic ways. And so there's been a number of tests of at least some of these predictions. Uh, and, and so usually these tests are carried out at the macroevolution scale, so looking at broad patterns of divergence across taxa, uh, and specifically how sexual dimorphism may or may not uh, be related to speciation rates so these empirical tests are interesting, but they're a little bit uh, unsatisfying because both of these predictions depend uh, on processes that are occurring in the very early stages of speciation, uh, and, and before reproductive isolation is complete, and before phenotypic divergence between the sexes uh, is explained. And so what we really like to do to test, uh, test these predictions uh, is find a way uh, where lineages are in the early stages uh, of speciating, uh, and where we also have at least some evidence of either the possibility of the ecological character displacement between the sexes or evidence that it's actually happening. <coughs> and so I'm gonna argue that uh, Eastern newts of the genus Apophobus might be a good system for this, uh, asking these questions about competition's role in adaptive radiation. Um, so these guys are uh, generalist semi-aquatic predatory salamanders uh, that feed and breed uh, in spawns. And so much of my PhD has been focused on the ecological underpinnings of uh, sexual dimorphism in one subspecies in this genus, Lacophilus iridescens iridescens. Uh, so when we look really closely at the morphology of the subspecies, we find that males and females have diverged subtly but significantly uh, in head shape. Uh, and so males, this is a male here on the left, uh, have narrower lower jaws, and have narrower, narrower gapes and longer lower jaws, whereas females have slightly wider gapes uh, and, and shorter lower jaws for their size. Uh, there's also some differences in head depth. And although this difference, these differences appear subtle, 
uh, they correlate with divergence in diet, <coughs> such that they also uh, corresponding divergence in habitat. Uh, and so my past work using experiments uh, has uh, provided some explicit evidence for that this morphological divergence is driven in part uh, by resource competition. Uh, so basically, uh, there's explicit evidence uh, for ecological characteristics of the sex. And so the, the two main pieces of evidence is that we find uh, disruptive, sexually antagonistic natural selection uh, occurring in breeding ponds in the aquatic adult phase. <coughs> uh, both fitness and selection are density and fruit dependent uh, in the manner expected under these competition models of divergence. And so we have, at least in one subspecies in this genus, evidence for character displacement between the sexes or an ecological model. So what's going on across the other species? Uh, well, when we look, uh, we find that there's, there's three species in the genus, uh, and, and uh, one species that's diverged into four subspecies. And so the fossil uh, when we sort of examine its natural history closely, appears to be an example of a young and ongoing adaptive variation. Uh, so specifically, when we look at subspecies uh, of the fossil iridescent, uh, we find that there's uh, this rapid uh, divergence uh, into unique niches associated with aquatic life. Uh, in that, uh, for example, uh, viridescent viridescence up on top uh, is, is adapted to semi-aquatic life, and, and adults actually uh, spend only a, par a portion of their life in the aquatic phase and can migrate out of breeding ponds in the winter, uh, and also have a prolonged terrestrial juvenile phase. And this reflects adaptation to living uh, in temporary ponds uh, in Appalachian and upland areas. <coughs> Whereas, for example, uh, viridescent <coughs> viridescola, which inhabits peninsular Florida, uh, uh, rarely leave the aquatic phase uh, and inhabit primarily from the water bodies. Uh, and so this divergence into these uh, niches associated with aquatic life uh, could be important for the evolution of the ecological sexual dimorphism, given that uh, my past work in, in one subspecies, viridescent viridescence, uh, showed that we have uh, sexually antagonistic natural selection acting in the breeding ponds. Uh, and so time spent uh, in, in the aquatic phase might play a key role uh, in, in sort of the opportunity for the evolution. Uh, and so I'm basically interested in asking three questions here. So does ecological sexual dimorphism evolve during the nascent stages of speciation uh, across subspecies of Mephophilus iridescens? And if so, uh, does sexual dimorphism associate uh, with aquatic life? Uh, so finally, uh, if we have the evolution of sexual dimorphism and ecological speciation happening at the same time, uh, we can ask if morphological divergence between the sexes and between species has occurred in different combinations as it is And so to get at these questions, uh, I compiled uh, measurements from a number of museum specimens uh, for both sexes, uh, for all species and subspecies in the genus. Uh, and so I, I measured the same traits that my past work had shown to be under ecological characteristics between the sexes. Uh, so from this data, uh, I estimated uh, among uh, uh, a covariant matrix S that can describe among taxa variation of sexual dimorphism. And this is just a covariance uh, of, of canonical coefficients from discriminant function analyses on the sexes estimated separately for each taxon. And then we can also calculate uh, our, our just uh, total among taxa phenotypic variation. And so this is the covariance matrix of taxon mean, the D matrix. And so this is both sexes and uh, so just total vari phenotypic variation among species and subspecies. And then we can examine how uh, these two types of variation relate to each other and relate to our within population estimates. Uh, and so first, uh, we can ask, uh, are we getting the evolution of sexual dimorphism in the nascent stages of speciation? Uh, and so what I'm plotting here uh, is the magnitude of sexual dimorphism on the y-axis, and this is just the mahalanobis of the species and sexes. Uh, and on the x-axis, uh, it, uh, it's, it's going to be the rank order of degree uh, of adaptation to aquatic life, so how much time uh, each subspecies uh, uh, spends in the, in the aquatic adult phase. And so first we have iridescent and iridescent here, uh, so when we look across subspecies, we find that, uh, first of all, there is uh, significant variation uh, in sexual dimorphism among subspecies. And there's also a significant association uh, with aquatic life. So uh, the subspecies that spend uh, more of their life uh, in the aquatic adult phase uh, have a greater magnitude of sexual dimorphism, consistent uh, with past work showing that sexual antagonistic natural selection occurs uh, in this aquatic phase. And so, Given that we have uh, the evolution of sexual dimorphism and speciation happening at the same time, we can then ask uh, uh, what directions they're occurring in phenotype splits. Uh, 
Um, so now I'm going to be flowing data from all the tax studies, uh, all subspecies uh, entities. Uh, and so I'm just going to plot two trade trips which illustrate the pattern as well. So on the y axis, we have jaw length, and on the x axis, we have scalp vent length or just body length. Uh, and so the points here are uh, phenotypic means uh, for males and females of each subspecies. So males are in red, females are in blue, uh, and males and females of the same subspecies or species are connected by a dashed line. And so the first thing we can notice uh, is that variation, uh, total variation among species and subspecies uh, is primarily occurring uh, in, in overall size. Uh, and so uh, this is reflected uh, when we plot this. This is the first eigenvector of the D matrix, and this is just uh, the vector that's describing the maximum amount of vari phenotypic variation among species and subspecies. And indeed, that's aligned with the overall performance of body size. Next, we can ask uh, how the sexes have diverged. Uh, so, uh, for, for how uh, variation among taxa and sexual dimorphism uh, relates. Uh, so we can characterize that by this first eigenvector of that matrix S. Uh, and so this is just the vector that's describing the maximum amount, maximum amount of among taxa variation in sexual dimorphism. We see that that's occurred nearly over probably uh, to variation among species, uh, overall variation among species, and primarily reflects uh, differences uh, in head shape. And so, Divergence between the species and between the sexes is occurring in different directions, but remember we also have uh, estimates of within population disruptive selection for one subspecies. And so now we can ask uh, how are our within population, within subspecies estimates of natural selection uh, align uh, with our patterns of variation between the sexes and between the species. And when we do that, um, so this is gamma max, and this is the first eigenvector of the uh, uh, matrix of uh, quadratic and correlational selection gradients, uh, we find that. Uh, it aligns quite closely with our variation among species variation in sexual dimorphism, but is nearly orthogonal to our uh, total among species variation. So variation in sexual dimorphism is predicted by within population disruptive selection. Uh, and uh, I'm going to skip that, but that's just showing that uh, basically when we estimate the sampling distributions of, of uh, the relationships between these vectors, uh, they are significantly different. Uh, and so the, the key results here is that uh, the extent of sexual dimorphism is associated with aquatic life across the top of the sphere decimals. Uh, and within population disruptive natural selection predicts variation in sexual dimorphism across the genes. Uh, and phenotypic, so phenotypic divergence between the sexes and species that occur together in different combinations of traits consistent with fear. And so uh, overall, the conclusion is that character decisions between the sexes can evolve together through the logical deviation. Uh, and that the evolution of sexual dimorphism might be playing a key 